uh, what are the operating cash flows, what are the financing cash flows, and what are the investment cash flows that you have in your business. And at the end of the day, you can have an idea whether you are having a cash surplus or a deficit in your business. So by using these three basic components of financial statements, as I said earlier, you can assess financial health. And you can make informed decisions because you have the figures with you, you have the numbers with you. Uh, just imagine you are doing the business without looking at financial statements. So you never know how much you have earned from your business. You must be jumping mon pumping money into your business, but you never know how much you have earned out of that investment. So for that, you have to know, you have to have the knowledge in reading the financial statements and identifying trends and patterns. By using these financial statements, you can identify trends and patterns. That is where if you take an example, let's say you plot the sales figures of your business for a particular year on a month wise, and you see that in some months you have sales peak and some months you have lower sales and it is the same with your historical periods. Then you know that there is a seasonal effect in your business. Then you can take strategies or maybe tactics to optimize the return in the months that you have high sales and you can use tactics and strategies to optimize the profit figure maybe to break even your business in the months where you have low sales. Likewise, by using these financial statements, you can identify the trends and patterns of your business. And most importantly, you can use these financial statements to elevate your business performance. You can compare this business performance with the set targets. You can set the financial targets at the beginning of the year and maybe at the end of the year, you can assess by looking at these financial statements whether you have uh, achieved your set targets or not. And as well as you can measure your performance with the industry or maybe with the peers in the market or maybe with the historical period, you can measure your performance whether you have done well or not. And most importantly, you can manage cash flows if you have the cash flow statement with you because you know what are your cash inflows and what are your cash outflows and whether you have a cash deficit or, or a surplus at the end of the period. If you have a cash surplus, then you can invest your money. So we'll move on to the next slide. The, this is calculating financial ratios. It doesn't mean by looking at the profit figures that you have done well in your uh, business if you do not calculate the ratios and see whether you have performed well or not. I'll illustrate that with an example. We have two businesses, business A and business B. And if you look at the profit figures of these two businesses, you can see business B has done well in terms of profit compared to business A. But if you calculate the ratios, the profit ratios, the profit margin and the return on equity, you can see the margins are higher in business A compared to business B. So that means by looking at the financial statements, by looking at the numerical numbers that appear on the financial statements, you cannot make informed decisions. So you have to have the financial statements and then you have to analyze the financial statements to understand whether you have really done well or not. So these I have uh, here I have selected three types of financial uh, ratios, but apart from these three, there are many more other financial ratios that are available. Here I have selected the most important ratios that are relevant for an entrepreneur. So other than this profit ratio, uh, which is very basic, we have liquidity ratio and the efficiency ratio. Liquidity ratio measures whether you are able to manage your liabilities with the current assets that you have in your business. It uh, shows whether you are liquid enough in your business to continue the business smoothly. And we have debt to equity ratio. It shows whether you are highly leveraged or not, whether you are highly depending on the debt or not, because always the debt component comes with a fixed expense. If you are highly leveraged, if you have high debt in your business, that means you should have the capacity to bear the fixed expense that is coming along with the debt component. Then the efficiency ratio. 
we have inventory turnover and the receivables turnover. Inventory turnover says whether your inventory is, how frequent your inventory is turning into sales. It doesn't matter you have heap of inventories in your business if it is not converting into sales. Having heap of inventories without a conversion to sales will cost you a lot. And receivables turnover, that is how well, how frequent your debtors are converting into cash. If you are having an issue with the receivables turnover, that means if your debtors are not paying you money, then you will be in a cash trouble. So if you have the financial statements and if you calculate these financial ratios, you can take informed decisions, you can take wise decisions based on the position of your business. So then we'll move to the trend analysis. Why you need to analyze the trend? So you have the financial statements and you have calculated the ratios. Then why you need to analyze the trend? It's because you have to evaluate your performance. You have to always measure your performance by using the trend. It doesn't matter you have done well in your business in this year. If you have done more well in your previous year and it means that you have actually lowered your performance. You are not performing well in this year. Then if you have done the trend analysis, you can evaluate whether your performance is good enough uh, this year or not. And as well as you can identify the trends, uh, like as I said earlier, the sales trends, the inventory turnover trends, only if you analyze the trend by using the financial statements. And as I said earlier, you can identify patterns and trends. It may be the inventory turnover patterns, or it may be the data turnover patterns, or it may be the sales figures, or maybe the profit trends. You can identify the trends by using the financial statements. And you have to analyze this over a period of time, or uh, maybe uh, in the current period on a month wise, you can analyze the trend. If you have the trend with you, if you know what is happening in your business over the past years and or maybe the current year, you can forecast your performance. If you know only the performance in the current year, you cannot forecast the performance because the performance is not static. It always changes based on the market conditions, based on the um, competitors' actions, the performance changes. So if you want to forecast the performance, you have to analyze the trends. You, you may have seen the reductions in your sales over the past years. That means something has happened in your business. Maybe the competitors are doing well. Maybe some market conditions that has uh, uh, effect in your lower sales figures. So if you know the trends, then you can ac accurately forecast your performance. I'm sorry then to benchmark your uh, performance with the competitors and maybe with the industry or maybe with the historical periods, you have to analyze the trends. So literacy on financial statements and knowing to read the financial statements is not enough for an entrepreneur because you need to know how to analyze the financial statements, how to calculate the ratios and how to do the trend analysis to make informed decisions and wise decisions in your business. Then we move to the next section, budgeting and cash flow management. Why budgeting and cash flow management is important for an entrepreneur? I know all of you must be knowing what is budgeting because uh, this is happening every year in the parliament. So budgeting is where you estimate your income and your expenses and see what is the bottom line figure in the next year. Likewise, the cash flow management is you are forecasting your cash inflows and you're forecasting your cash outflows in the next year and you're seeing whether you are having a cash deficit or surplus in the coming financial year. Why you need to budget your expenses and income and why you need to manage your cash flows? Because it ensures you have adequate liquidity to cover your operational needs. Let's say you have a cash deficit in the coming year and you are planning to buy some vehicles or maybe properties in the next year for your business, then that means you are not able to do your expansion with the current cash flows that you are having. Then you will have to see what are the options available for you to finance your business. So likewise, forecasting your cash flows, forecasting your incomes and expenses is important for an entrepreneur. Then 
always maintain a cash reserve for emergency funding because you never know when the things happen. You need to have a cash reserve with you to properly manage your business. It is very important. We will talk about it later in the presentation. When managing cash flows, you have to take these steps. As an entrepreneur, you have to create a cash flow forecast. It is very important for an entrepreneur because you have put your money into the business and you don't want to lose your money. It's your money and you don't want to lose it. So you have to create a cash flow forecast. You have to identify surpluses and shortages in your cash flows. And you have to prioritize essential expenses. If you are going to buy a vehicle in the next year for the business, and if you are having a cash deficit, and if you don't want to go for debt financing, then prioritize your expenses. Think whether you essentially need to buy that vehicle or not. And always maintain a cash reserve for emergencies. That is very important for an entrepreneur. And always improve your collection. That means get the money from the debtors on time. Uh, have proper policies for recoveries and optimize your payables. Get credit facilities. When you're optimizing your payables, uh, try to uh, have grace periods in paying off the payables and manage inventory uh, by purchasing the inventories at the right time without having much inventories in the uh, stores. Do purchases at the right time when you want to do the sales. So the tip here is you have to manage your expenses by tracking spending and you have to distinguish distinguish between the needs and wants needs anyway you have to satisfy but there are several other ways you need to satisfy a need select the best possible way for you in satisfying the needs and also you have to eliminate your impulse buy and set savings goals irrespective of the income that you earn and have an emergency funding and always invest part of your income in fixed income securities because the cash inflow will be fixed for a certain period of time. Then debt management and financing options. When you talk about financing options, there are three options available for an entrepreneur. One is bootstrapping. That is where you pump your money into the business and you don't want to divest your investment or you don't want to have the debt financing in your business. The second option is equity investment. That is, you are divesting your investment and sharing your investment with another parties. Then the debt financing is where you get some loans from banks and financial institutions and pumping money into the business. So these three options are available for an entrepreneur to finance the business. But there are pros and cons in all these three options. If you bootstrap, then your growth will be limited because you may not be having much money with you. Uh, and But at the same time, if you bootstrap, it will give you the flexibility and control and the wealth that you have created will only be yours. But if you go for equity financing, that is where you divest your investment, then you will get more money into the business. And uh, as well as the money, you might be pumping the expertise or maybe the good insight into the business. But at the same time, you will be losing your control and flexibility if you go for equity investment. And if you go for debt financing, then that is always comes with a fixed cost not like the equity investment or the bootstrapping because you have to repay your loans and you have to pay the interest on time. Otherwise, you will be in a trouble. But you will have your control and you will have your flexibility and the money that you generated will be only yours. So these are the pros and cons in these three financing options. Uh, and if you use the debt financing, there are three type, uh, two types of debt that are available in the market that is secure debt and the unsecured debt and it can be either short term medium term or the long term depending on the requirement that you are having in your business and when you evaluate the financing options you have to always see the terms and repayment schedules and the interest rates you have to see whether this loan is 
uh, can be repaid with the schedule given by the uh, bank or the financial institution is it favorable for you whether the terms are favorable for you and most importantly the interest rate because if you are going for debt and uh, when you take the current scenario in the market we are having uh, much low interest rates in the market then if you are going for a debt financing the best option is going for a fixed interest rate loan with long term uh, structure and if you are having a a high interest rate regime in the current periods, then go for short-term loan or maybe go for long-term floating rates. So likewise, depending on the market conditions, you can evaluate the debt financing options and select the best possible option for you. For that, you have to have the financial knowledge with you. So the tip here is you have to create a settlement budget if you're going for a debt financing because there is a fixed cost element with the, uh, arising with the debt financing and uh, you can either do debt avalanche or debt snowball when you are settling the debt. That is where uh, you can pay off high interest debt at first. Uh, if you are doing the debt avalanche, that will always depend on the cash flows that you are generating. If you have the high cash flows in the coming years, then you can pay off high interest debts and be free. And if you want to do the debt snowball, that is it paying off the smaller debts first and then concentrate on the high interest uh, debts. It will all depend on the cash flows that you are generating in the next few years. And always negotiate with creditors and get a grace period and uh, ask for a favorable repayment schedules and terms and reschedule your debts if it is possible. And most importantly, whether you are debt financing or bootstrapping or equity financing, you have to have the financial discipline with you if you want to be succeeded as an entrepreneur. So the investment strategies. What are the investment strategies available for an entrepreneur? It can be either long-term or the short-term investment. It will be your, your risk appetite, Anyway, the investment, whether it's long-term or short-term, is a risk return trade-off, and it will be depending on your risk appetite. And my advice is, if you're doing an investment, you have to always diversify your investments. You can either invest part of your income in fixed income securities like uh, FDs or repo investments or maybe in uh, debentures. And part of your income can be in stock market in at some times which gives higher returns for you so the ground rule is if you are investing do diversification as an example let's say if you have invested all of your money in the stock market you never know when the dividends will come and you never know when the prices will be up and when you can get the uh, capital gains by trading so as an entrepreneur if you are a startup you need to have fixed income in the first few years because you are just a stopped up company. And when you grow up, you can go for uh, complicated investment strategies. But at the starting point, you should be having some emergency funding and some fixed income investments with you. So what are the tax planning and uh, compliance applicable for entrepreneurs? As an entrepreneur, as a startup company, you may be a sole proprietorship or maybe a, a corporate registered under the ROC. If you are a sole proprietorship, then for the taxation, you will be treated as one person, you and the business. And if you are a corporate, you will be separated as a different person and the business is different. So it will depend on your uh, tax planning strategy, whether you want to be a sole proprietorship or a private limited company. So according to the current uh, rule, anyone above 18 years of age should register with the uh, IRD and get a, a TIN number. But it doesn't mean that you have to pay taxes whether you are registered or not, because uh, you should be having an income above 1.2 million per year to pay the taxes, otherwise you can just uh, file the return and stay without paying. So whether you're sole proprietor or a corporate, you have to pay income taxes and withholding taxes applicable for the investments that you make and the capital gain taxes for the investments uh, that you sell 
And uh, if you are a private limited company, uh, if you are employing salaried employees, you will have to pay pay taxes. And if you are uh, having a revenue above the threshold limits, you might have to pay VAT and SSCL. So these uh, taxes are applicable for uh, companies and the sole proprietors. But at the same time, there are several tax management strategies available for entrepreneurs like deductions, reliefs, and WHT credits. So you can utilize those uh, deductions and reliefs available for an entrepreneur in optimizing your wealth. Uh, if I go with the uh, losses, let's say if you have incurred losses in your business and if you are a private limited company, you might have incurred losses in uh, the past few years and you can set up these losses with the upcoming profits of your business. So you can do that only if you have the financial knowledge with you. And also, let's say you are loss making and you want to amalgamate your business with an, another business. So the company uh, that is uh, amalgamated can utilize these losses to set off against the combined profit. So these uh, kind of uh, tax planning strategies or the tactics are available, but uh, as a corporate citizen, and as a business, the advice is, if you do not have the expertise with you, go for a uh, person who is, ex who is an expert and get the assistance and do the tax planning and tax um, compliance on time. Uh, it will give you a hassle-free life and then you can concentrate well on your business activities. Then why risk management and insurance is important for an entrepreneur? It's because you have invested your own money into the business and you don't want to lose your money, you don't want to lose your properties. So for that, you have to have the insurance with you. You can protect your business from the natural disasters, maybe from the market volatility or maybe from uh, liability issues or maybe from the uh, interruptions in the business do insure your business because as a startup you cannot take you cannot absorb much risk of your business so the advice is to have the uh, full coverage insurance for your business and regularly review the insurance coverage to ensure that you have adequate protection against the upcoming risks so the finally there are a few tips for your financial success one is as an entrepreneur, you have to have clear financial goals in your business and continuously measure your performance with the set targets and always surround yourself with experts. It may be your friends or maybe associations. Have a networking group with you and get the advice from them when you are going to do something and always seek professional advice and continuously educate yourself if you think that you don't have the expertise on some area. Because for a, as an entrepreneur, it is important for you to focus on your core competencies and outsource the rest. It will give you more time for you to concentrate on your business success rather than worrying about the things that you do not know. Then always seek for business networking opportunities because as a startup, you want to grow your business. So business networking is very important for you to climb up the ladder. So that's about the presentation. So in closing, I want to leave you with the thought that the financial freedom is not a destination. It's a journey. And it is about making intentional choices today that will empower you to live the life you envision tomorrow. Therefore, financial freedom is only available to those who learn it and who only practice it. Thank you very much. Over to you, Shashi. Thank you so much, Tinani. That was really insightful. Thank you for that segment. We'll now move on to our guest speaker, Nishali. Nishali Pereira, she's the co-founder and director of Yeti Isotonics. Uh, Yeti is the leading sports drink brand in Sri Lanka. I'm personally a huge fan of Yeti, so I'm really happy to have this opportunity to ask Nishali some questions. 
I'll tell you a bit about Nishali before we start. She began her career in Texas, and this was building econometric models for prominent clients such as Nestle and Walmart. Uh, after returning to Sri Lanka, Nishali served as the head of strategy at Morrison's Limited, one of the largest pharmaceutical manufacturing companies in Sri Lanka, before co-founding Yeti. Yeti is a nutraceutical company aimed at creating globally competitive Sri Lankan products. Under Nishali's leadership, Yeti, Yeti has launched 27 successful products within the last seven years, and they distribute both domestically and they also export to the USA. Nishali is also certified in circular design and manufacturing, focusing on sustainable business models. This is particularly in the fashion industry. Additionally, she's also a certified fitness instructor, and this really displays her passion for health and the outdoors. Um, over to you, Nishali. Nishali is going to give a personal note to begin with, and then I'll move on to some questions. If anyone has any questions for either Diluni or Nishali, they can raise those in the Q&A section. Thank you. Thanks, Shashi, for that introduction. Uh, before I start, I want to thank Diluni for that presentation. There was so many things in there that I was thinking, I wish somebody told me this uh, when I started the business eight years ago. And there were also some things in there. I'm like, oh, that's a new information for me. And I made some notes. So thank you, Diluni. That was incredibly insightful. Uh, and I'm sure you helped a lot of people not make the same mistakes I made when we started because I didn't know that information. Um, and thank you, Randinit, for inviting me here to speak today uh, and for everyone at uh, First Capital um, for trusting me to share some insights. Um, so before we start in, uh, in with the Q&A session, I have a question that I want to throw uh, at you guys just to think about. What is the secret sauce of building a successful entrepreneurial venture? Um, every day you see businesses start uh, and they're gone within six months, they're gone in a year, they're gone in uh, three years. Very few businesses, uh, you know, last up to at least five years. And as a business entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, that's terrifying statistics uh, that most businesses don't even, uh, you know, live up to the five-year mark. So this is something I'm constantly thinking about. What does it take uh, to build a successful entrepreneurial venture that will kind of uh, uh, have some longevity. Um, I don't know the answer at a global scale. The only answer I know is what is true for Yeti and what has been true for us. Um, the success of Yeti, I think, has come from two things, uh, from grit and agility. Um, so let's kind of break that down. Uh, what What is grit, right? So grit is, um, how do I... Uh, define it. It's grit is resilience uh, backed by an unwavering belief in a successful outcome. Uh, so that's, if, if you're a really gritty person, and I, I kind of think that Dilshan and I are grit, gritty people, that is, um, you have extreme confidence that you are going to be successful in whatever this product or project or company that you're launching. And then you put in the blood, sweat and tears and 150% to see that through. So on uh, entrepreneurship is not for the faint-hearted. Uh, so many things go wrong. In an, if you think working at a company is hard, you know, being an entrepreneur is a hundred times harder. So you don't get into entrepreneurship if you're not gritty. Like if you don't think that it doesn't matter what comes my way, it doesn't matter what this country goes through, it doesn't matter what people kind of throw at you. Um, you have to kind of have that uh, insight that it doesn't matter, uh, have that resilience to think that you will uh, see whatever you started through and have absolute confidence that you're going to make it successful. People asked me at the onset of Yeti, what's your exit plan? And I was so confused. I was like, exit plan? I mean, this is going to be a success. I'm not going to shut this down. So um, if you're starting an entrepreneurial venture, I highly recommend you to start with that gritty attitude. Um, the second thing is to be agile. You've seen what this country went through over the last five years. We started with COVID, then an economic crisis, no petrol, no electricity. So you have to be extremely agile in a country like Sri Lanka to survive long term. And what that means is being very unconventional, unconventional and creative in your approach to solving problems. Um, and whether it's product development, sales, marketing, kind of every, don't follow the path that the big boys are following. Uh, try to come up with creative out-of-the-box uh, ideas uh, and keep changing course depending on um, uh, what the external situations are. And be very um, 
fast in your decision making uh, so that um, because it takes a long time for a big organization to, to turn their ship. As an entrepreneur, you have that flexibility, agility to make fast decisions and make those quick decisions so that uh, you can get ahead of your big, uh, the com bigger competitors with much larger resources. Uh, so uh, I don't know what makes entrepreneurs successful in a global scale, but all I can share is I, our journey. And what I want to leave with you is that uh, for us, success has come through being gritty and being agile. And I hope that you can apply a little bit of that to your venture uh, so that you can also kind of um, see um, success in a difficult uh, in difficult environments. Uh, Shashi, I'm ready to take on any questions that you guys have. Thank you, Nishali. That was a really, really good introduction. I love what you said about grit and resilience, and I completely agree. Um, so the first question that we have for you is actually how, when you when you first found a startup, how do you scale? Um, and you already mentioned that it's obviously been a very difficult time uh, for Sri Lanka, for the Sri Lankan economy. So how would you advise people to scale their businesses and to prevent them from not being able to make it long term? Um, again, I, I don't know what the answers are you know, the right answers, but I can only share with you what we did and what worked for us. And what worked for us, so we started the company in 2016 and um, we kind of threw around a few ideas um, and we came up with this idea for an isotonic energy energy drink. Um, and we didn't, there wasn't expert the expertise we required in Sri Lanka. So we partnered with um, some German and Austrian food scientists to come up with the product. Um, and six months into it, once we had our product formulation, we did a very risky thing. Uh, I quit my job uh, and sank all my life savings into starting Yeti. And we channeled uh, and we uh, started with a small uh, small manufacturing plant. Uh, we got Colombo University boys to uh, build each of our all of our machines. Uh, so we didn't kind of spend a lot on um on you know importing uh, big machinery and and all of that, um, so for us we started very small and then we uh, we kind of uh, we scaled up by introducing new product var varieties and new new categories that we went into. Um, so I think um, and, and and in the long term, uh, if you want to scale up, uh, Sri Lanka is the twenty two million people is not quite big enough to go really big. So you have to start small, capture the Sri Lankan market. And once you have failed and succeeded and learned from the Sri Lankan market, you scale up, uh, you have to scale up to the global market to see kind of like large scale um, uh, growth. Um, does that help? <laughs> yeah, that is really helpful. Thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, so the next question is, a lot of people struggle with funding, right? And that's the main barrier to starting something. So are there any opportunities that you know about for people to get funding for their small businesses or for their startups? Um, so I think in Sri Lanka, there's uh, there are several incubators uh, and there are several large conglomerates uh, that have um, that invest in startups in their field. So MAs would invest in kind of like apparel related startups or HEMAs would invest in kind of wellness related startups. So there are large conglomerates that might invest in uh, startups in their uh, industry. Um, and there's also several in, uh, angel investors. But I must say that I do not have any personal experience working with any of these. Uh, because out of the three, um, out of the three options that Diluni presented to you, we chose that bootstrapping investment. So to date, uh, I, I basically put in all my savings, and then Dilshan matched that exact amount, so that we went in as fifty percent owners. And to date, we haven't taken any um, uh, outside investment or loans or overdraft or anything. Uh, and that is one way of funding it. Just put in whatever small capital you have, and then you keep reinvesting whatever you're earning to grow uh, to, towards your working capital and towards growing the company. Um, so the option we chose was bootstrapping, and it has worked for us. Uh, it kept us uh, on the 
uh, the narrow, difficult path, uh, but it also kept us out of trouble uh, because we didn't have the money to waste. We didn't have the money to kind of uh, uh, throw around on unrealistic uh, projects. Um, but if you do choose the investment option, there are angel investors and incubators in Sri Lanka for startups. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Uh, that actually leads really nicely into the next question, which is about financial planning. And in your experience, what are some common mistakes that you've seen entrepreneurs make? And what would your advice be on how to avoid those mistakes? You can just draw from your own personal experience as well, if it's okay. applicable. Um, so I think one of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make is not being frugal in the first early days. You don't need a big office space. You don't need a fancy, uh, you know, fancy launch party. You don't need a big marketing budget and you definitely shouldn't be drawing a big salary uh, out of your entrepreneurial ventures. So in the early stages, you should be extremely frugal and every, you know, every rupee you spend, think about whether that money is going towards something that is uh, towards business growth. Um, so with Yeti, what we did was, uh, I mean, we had very little capital to start with. So what we did was all the money we had, we invested in what was important to us. And what was important to us was creating a really great product. Uh, so we wanted like we wanted like the highest, uh, you know, from a scientific point of view, we wanted the best possible product. So we invested in product formulation and we instead invested in setting up a factory because we didn't want to outsource manufacturing. We wanted we wanted to manufacture our own product at a GMP certified plant. So we set up our own manufacturing and labs. So once we had invested our money in um, in a setting up uh, a plant labs and uh, a product formulation, we had nothing left for you know all the extra stuff. So we didn't rent office space. We worked out of our homes. We didn't rent vehicles. We used our own personal cars. We didn't have a lot of employees. Adyoshan and I pretty much just drove our cars around delivering products. Um, and we started adding those things only once revenue started coming in. So once revenue started coming in, we st slowly started building our, our employee carder. We slowly started buying vehicles for deliveries um, and maybe started investing a little bit on the marketing front. Uh, but in the early years, you had to be extremely frugal and be like very careful with your spending. Uh, I think Diluni put it really well with uh, with with her presentation. If you can follow her advice, um, it's been it's it's been true for us. You can't be uh, you can't spend on your wants, spend on your needs. And with the with spending on your needs, think about if what I'm spending is contributing towards business growth. If it's only contributing towards a brand name, boosting your ego, whatever else it is, don't spend on it. Spend only if it's going to add towards a business growth. Thank you, Nishali. I think a really big challenge that entrepreneurs face is that need to be driven and self-motivated. And there's so much discipline required, right? When you don't have an external employer who's telling you what to do, you kind of have to do everything yourself. What are some working norms that you think entrepreneurs and those who aspire to be entrepreneurs should adopt in order to maintain that discipline and to be successful? Yeah. Um. So with... um. Um, with with I think a common misconception is that just because it's a startup, it's you know you see all this kind of startup culture in the movies, and the misconception is you don't need uh you don't need like a plan, you don't need discipline, you don't need to be at work by uh, you know eight a.m. Uh, I think all of those are misconceptions. When you start uh when you when you start an entrepreneurial venture, you have to be like even more disciplined than. If you're working for someone, um, two things I would recommend, uh, two things to set up in the early years. One is set up very, uh, very clear cut, uncomplicated processes, uh, especially for accounting, for manufacturing, for sales and distribution. Make sure there's a process for everything. You don't need to in invest in like expensive software. QuickBooks and Excel is more than enough to solve all your early on business needs. Um, make sure that you set up clear processes and then have the discipline to follow those processes. So have a process for how do I track who's who owes me money? How do I track my sales? Um, what are the processes for uh, purchasing inventory? Um, you know, have a process for each thing that's important to you and have the discipline to follow it. 
Uh, the second thing, again, something Diluni uh, touched on was um, was making data driven decisions. That is super important. Um, so a few things that we track at ET on a monthly basis, we look at sales sliced and diced every different way, which products are making us money, which customers are making us money, which areas, which regions. Uh, so uh, we look at our sales in very detail because Pareto really works. It's 80% of your revenue comes from, you know, from 20% of sources. So you look at your sales, we look at our profitability. Uh, we look at who owes us money and collections. Um, and um, I forgot the fourth. Uh, sales, profitability, outstanding and kind of your, your plan for the, for the next month. So make sure that you are tracking your performance and your look, you look at those metrics and then make data-driven decisions. So have processes and make data-driven decisions is the two things that I can advise. Okay, amazing. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question before I open up to the audience questions. Uh, this is a difficult one. So it's the last question I have for you. What is the biggest challenge that you've faced so far in this journey and how did you overcome it? Um, the difficult, uh, the, uh, the challenge I think is that, um, Sri Lanka as a country isn't really conducive for, uh, entrepreneurs. There is no, there's no support for, there's no ecosystem, uh, for business entrepreneurs, um, to kind of get, get investment, uh, be able to, um, get help when things are difficult. Um, and also the legal system is very difficult and not really con conducive for entrepreneurs. We have constantly ridiculous, uh, ridiculous, um, cases against us that make absolutely no sense. So the environment is a little bit difficult, um, uh, to to survive in as an entrepreneur um, and I think my answer kind of goes back to uh, to the first thing I said it's just that you have to kind of you have to decide that it doesn't matter what the business environment is what the country's uh, situation is it doesn't matter what uh, ridiculous uh, you know, legal cases are put against you, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what any of the external circumstances are, you have to be gritty enough uh, to decide you're going to be successful regardless of everything that's thrown against you. And also you have to be agile enough, start shifting your business model, your products, um, um, uh, or, or whatever um, you're doing, uh, to adapt to those situations, a, a quick example before I uh, before I finish, when COVID nineteen happened, uh, we were selling sports drinks to athletes and you know big sporting events. When COVID happened, like all of that happened, we went down to zero sales. So what we did was we quickly pivoted to Ayurveda medicine and collagen. Uh, so we made like this Kottamalli product. We made and and then in the beauty space we made a collagen, which is like a beauty product for you know your skin, hair, nails. And today, because of that pivot, collagen is almost overtaking our sports drink uh, brand, which was our starting product. So when a difficult circumstance comes and you are able to pivot and be agile, sometimes that out of those difficult situations, like new ideas and new products can also rise. So be gritty and be agile. <laughs> Thank you, Nishali. That's really inspiring. Um, I'm just going to move on to a couple of questions that we've received from the audience. And the first one is, how important is your support system? You spoke about grit and resilience. And this person has asked, especially as a woman, um, a female entrepreneur, do you see changes in societal attitudes that now support women to take these entrepreneurial journeys? Uh, your your personal support system is incredibly important. I got really, really lucky because I have uh, a really great business partner who is, um, you know, who kind of matches, uh, who complements my set of skills. Uh, so having a business partner uh, and a support system is, um, has I've, I've been fortunate having a good support system, but society as a large is still not, um, not great for female entrepreneurs. Uh, there's so many times that I would go to the bank and uh, the bank person would respond to my business partner who is the male person and not me 
or, or that you know you go into business meetings uh, and people don't even make eye to contact with you because you're female or uh, you know it, this the society hasn't hasn't kind of um, evolved enough uh, to create a um, good environment for female entrepreneurs. The only thing I can say is that you have to succeed despite what comes uh, at you. So uh, what, what we can do as female entrepreneurs is be successful despite the challenges so that the next generation of female entrepreneurs that can come after us uh, have, have the pathway that's already built for us, for them. Yeah, and I think what you said is is a hundred percent correct. You also just need to be who you are, take up space, keep doing what you're doing, and then I think that's how change is forced, right? Because there are people like you who are female entrepreneurs who are occupying space in 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 that field and who are then changing the stereotypes and proving that women can actually achieve those things. Um, I, I love that statement. Take up space. That's just exactly it. You you have to uh, you do have to take up space and like even like where you sit at at the table is important. As females, we kind of tend to you know give other people the seat, sit in a corner. Like even where you decide to sit at a business table is important. Uh, you know, we also tend to think about everything as women. We tend to think our entire thought before we speak at a meeting, whereas men would just blurt it out when they have half a thought. So that's, you know, we, we've got to kind of take up space, say what we need to, uh, and not worry about the fact that the environment isn't ready for us. Exactly. And I think we at, at JXG, we've been talking a lot about unconscious bias, and that's something more companies are talking about now moving forward. And there are barriers like that which hold women back, women, minorities. Um, a lot of the time, it's just unconscious. So when people like you challenge those norms, I think that's how change is just forced. Um, so our next question actually is for Diluni. Uh, Diluni, this person has asked about your segment on financial tips. And they've said that you spoke about setting clear financial goals, but... They want to know how to set them exactly. What are the metrics or factors to consider when setting financial goals? Uh, yes, Sashi, there is no clear cut answer for that uh, question. It all depends on the vision or the dream that the person is having. So uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to have a long vision for your business. So it can be a 30 or 40 year journey. And that is your ultimate goal. So to achieve that goal, you have to have periodic KPIs or maybe short-term goals. So in that case, you can have annual goals for your business. It may be the profit figures that you want to achieve in the next year, or maybe the number of products that you want to introduce in the next couple of years. And it can be the operational uh, uh, KPIs that you are going to implement whether you are going to have uh, more plants in your business in the next uh, couple of years, how many employees are you going to uh, employ in your business. So likewise, you can have financial goals and the operational goals for you, and it should be short-term, but working towards the long-term vision of your business. And the factor that you should consider in setting these goals is, uh, ideally, the goals should be, uh, you know, uh, real realistic. You cannot have... Uh, goals which are not realistic and be upset of not achieving them. So you have to have realistic goals. And when uh, deciding your goals, you have to consider the market conditions. It doesn't matter you introduce new products if the market doesn't need it. So without uh, setting unrealistic goals, you have to set realistic goals and see what markets wants and always see whether you have the capacity, the resources available with you to achieve that goals. It can be the financial resources, it can be the uh, other physical resources, maybe the plants or the capacity in your plants or maybe the employees. So uh, my advice is if you want to be a visionary entrepreneurship, have short-term goals first for uh, to work towards the long-term vision. Thank you, Dilini. Uh, Nishali, do you have anything you'd like to add to that answer? You can address the same question if you like. That, that was so complete. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've got one more, which is um, for both of you. You can just decide who goes first. 
uh, this person has said disruption gets you ahead, but if you have a me too product that caters to mass needs, should the entrepreneurial strategies of your startup be different if that's the case and how? Dinani, do you want to tackle that first? So initially, please go ahead. Go ahead, Dinani. Initially, I think as an entrepreneur, you are the best to answer, answer that question. Yeah. Uh, so the question was whether it was the question that uh, disruption. I can, I, can repeat I can repeat it. So basically, they've said disruption gets you ahead. But if you have a Me Too product that caters to mass needs, should the entrepreneurial strategies of your startup be different and how? That's a tough one for me to answer because I I don't I I I don't do me too product as in like I I yeah. don't believe in doing me too products. Uh, so we've always chosen the path to disruption, uh, and then made it affordable enough that the masses could afford it. Um, so I have always kind of stayed on the path of disruption, um, and not really for it too much into um, into creating uh, me too products. Uh, and I kind of, you know, I recommend that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs follow that because uh, the big boys can make uh, generic products. Uh, it's up to us uh, to disrupt the market, to create waves um, and to um, to give customers something that they, that they really don't have. Um, I think one of the things that I always harp on is that we ask consumers what they want. We do surveys and all of that, ask, do consumer research and we ask people what they want. And then we give them exactly that because we think that's what they want. But that's that's you're putting the onus of, of creativity onto the consumer. You're putting the uh, the onus of, of uh, product development into the hands of the masses. So I think it's up to us as entrepreneurs to think out of the box, come up with creative ideas of what can I do that the Sri Lankan consumer doesn't have and then offer it to them and see whether they want it. And then uh, if they if it is something that they do want, you can scale it up uh, by making it more affordable for the masses. I know I didn't answer your question, but I truly don't know the answer of taking me to products to the market. That's okay. I think that's exactly what you did by launching the collagen product, right? Because it was a difficult situation. You said you had to pivot. So I think that's still helpful in answering the okay, question. Great. <laughs> so that's actually, we're coming towards the end, but I wanted to ask you initially, um, just in closing, what advice would you give to aspiring entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who have already started if you had to give them like your most important piece of advice in this journey, what would that be just in closing? Um, two things. One is when you start, uh, be very, very uh, clear on who your target market is and then have a laser focus on serving their needs. Uh, when we started with an isotonic drink, we could have said an isotonic drink is for anyone, right? Like grandmother going in the hot sun or the dengue patient, anyone can drink an isotonic, but we wanted to our focus was people who are serious athletes and people who are serious about fitness. And then we focused our um, uh, product formulation, our marketing, our manufacturing, everything to serving the needs of a targeted audience. And when you do that, when you when you have a laser focus on who you're serving, one, you create products that are really serving their, their niche needs. And secondly, you build a super loyal customer base. Um, the second thing I want to say is that uh, Sri Lanka is this amazing playground for uh, testing and creating new products. Um, because it's a small market, we're a close-knit community, ideas get around so fast. So use Sri Lanka to create new products, create uh, try out new ideas, new platforms, and then learn from the mistakes uh, and successes in of what you do in Sri Lanka, and then use that as a springboard to launch into a global market. Uh, because uh, I think we need to take our products, our ideas uh, to the global market to, to see 
really scaled success um, where people who built you know great things in Anuradhapur or Naro Japna you go see what we have built as historically as people we built amazing things and now we tend to think that things made in Germany and Japan are better than what we can build so I think we need to flip that believe that we are great creators and use Sri Lanka as a test market and then use it that as a springboard uh, to take uh, Sri Lankan products to the world. I love that. That's so positive. And I think it's such an important message for everyone listening in. Thank you, Nishali. Um, great. So, Thank you so much for inviting me. No, your segment was great. Thank you. I, I think people can really benefit from both of you and from the advice that you've given. And we hope to have more events like this. So be sure to tune in next time. This will be an ongoing series. It was started for Women's Day and Women's Month, but it's definitely something that we aim to continue because it's in line with First Capital's vision, which is improving the lives of all Sri Lankans through financial solutions. Thank you, Diluni. Your segment was so useful. Nishali, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we can end here. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for making the time on a working day. I hope that everyone enjoyed this session.